In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Can we believe that something extraordinary is about to happen? No. No. Well, good I wrote this sermon then. <laughs> well, you will all know that the snowman is 40 years old. That's the storybook, not the snow men and women and children that we've made for centuries. Phoenix animated Christmas window commemorates that storybook anniversary. And I have to say it's my favorite window since they've removed all Christian symbolism many years ago. And that doesn't bother me, not this year, because I think it's it's an incredible window. At least the book and the window celebrate things like friendship, relationships, adventure, journey, and especially childlike belief. <coughs> I saw it during the day, uh, on Friday, I guess. Um, and there were only other adults around and a few toddlers. And someone remarked, not me, nice to see it without a lot of children getting in the way. <laughs> Christmas is not just for children. Though we need it to be a good experience for them, and we need them to show us a childlike, not childish, faith. Even if you've seen the window, that final scene tucked around the corner, in the last window, a pile of melted snow, which was the snowman, with hat and scarf laying on top, but also the boy's own scarf, as a tangible memory that what he experienced was real. I thought they might have left that bit off, actually. But the fact is, children can access that transitory nature of life without being morbid, like we are sometimes. It did happen. It did enrich the boy, it's now a memory. We each will hopefully have memories of seasons past, good, hilarious, some with sadness, but this cycle continues, and hopefully we continue celebrating. And Advent is a part of this joyful, celebrating season. We shouldn't miss it, this beginning bit. As with any anticipated event in our lives, a special birthday, an anniversary, a holiday, Even a snowman has to be made. These things take preparation, and that's part of the adventure. Getting ready for an expected event is often as important because it prepares us to fully grasp the experience. And so it should be with our preparations for the birth of Jesus. So, can God break into our world so that we experience something new, something extraordinary, something we haven't had before? Today's readings from the Bible, especially the Gospel, it calls us to an attentiveness, an expectation that something will change. Our world 
Sometimes we think it's in a sorry state. And we can be numbed by the enormity of the problems we see in our country and the world around. And the way people react to this. <coughs> our communal response, official government response, can often be one of desperation, hatefulness in speech. There are a lot of hateful things that people write and text and, uh, and say these days in response to what's going on around us. And greediness in action, we must protect ourselves. You can blame it on Trump or Brexit or a punitive benefit system or whatever. But those can't be blamed for the hatefulness and selfishness which seems always on the surface these days. They are just the results of what society says it wants. Those are the things we vote for. It's a secular model of how we quell our fears, how we protect ourselves from, from what? From God's world? God promises a better way of living. God, Jeremiah tells us, is righteousness. And he will come and deliver that. What is promised will lead us to a more just, abundant, generous, and loving life and death. Jeremiah did not mince words in denouncing the current state of things in his own day. But he promised hearts would be changed. And Luke, the gospel we read, takes up this theme as Luke reflects on actually a pretty bad situation. The devastation of Jerusalem. The temple had been completely knocked down, obliterated forever. And in that setting, Luke tells us, be attentive, watch, look around you. This is just the end, the last throes of something, and something very new and wonderful is going to emerge. Raise up your heads, look for the coming of your Savior. And this is not to spoil our fun, our, our pre-Christmas fun and all of that. There's plenty of joy to be had in preparing for the coming of Jesus. We just need to make sure we are preparing for something that really matters and anticipating that our lives and the world will actually change. <laughs> that is what Luke asks of us. Yet, we're fascinated by the ugliness, the treachery of the world in which we live. It's always in the news. But, like our politicians and our government policies, those things are reported because that's what we want to read. When I say we, I know you say, well, I don't feel that way. <laughs> It's a, it's a general feeling of which, unfortunately, we are a part. <coughs> we are a world that feeds on dramatic tragedy and the worst and the most unredeemed parts of God's world. How do we prepare for a new and extraordinary thing that's going to come and change our lives? Well, try beauty. Just a suggestion. Do it locally. 
Take a walk up to St. Michael's Church, the highest point in Newcastle. Look out over the city. See some beauty there. Go down to the river. Have a walk along there. Go visit some cherished friends or relations. Not to complain about things, but just to enjoy their presence. There's so much beauty around us, and we need to remind ourselves see, that that is there in our world. We need to give thanks for the natural and human beauty we have. We need to be attentive. We need to observe human beings being human to one another and then try it ourselves. <laughs> there is so much beauty around us. Surely God has been and is here and now ready to do new things. Fennec's window brought me joy and as I said, it's okay that there wasn't a crib for shepherds or whatever this year. It's a beautiful thing, even in the midst of that commercial hotline. But more to the point, when we do celebrate the birth of Jesus in the crib, with the shepherds, and the wise men, and the sheep, that joy should be all the more magnified by the preparations that we have made in these weeks leading up to it by our attentiveness to how God has already broken into our world in truly beautiful ways. We don't need to manufacture a false Christmas that makes us feel good. We only have to notice and to give thanks for the beauty of God already in our midst. And then it won't be difficult to imagine and live out a new thing, an extraordinary thing in our lives and the lives of those around us. Amen.